Welcome to Candid Catholic Convos, a program brought to you by the Catholic Diocese of Harrisburg. Our mission is to humanize the church and help you to grow in your faith, love, and understanding. I'm your host, Rachel Troche, a cradle Catholic who's only human and struggled with faith on more than one occasion. Each week, you'll hear engaging, down-to-earth interviews and actionable strategies you can implement into your life with ease to help you grow closer to God. If you're ready to open your heart and step fully into the person God created you to be, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hey, hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of Candid Catholic Convos. Autumn is officially here with its plethora of brightly colored leaves, cool chill in the air, my favorite flavor of coffee, and my kids' second favorite holiday, Halloween. Growing up, it was always one of my top five holidays, snuggled nicely in between Christmas and Easter. I like candy. What can I say? I loved venturing out into my neighborhood resembling my favorite character from a movie or as some creation I crafted with my friends. Now I love to do family costume themes with my kids, and they get a kick out of it too. Last year, we went as everyone's favorite parapsychologists operating a ghost-catching business in New York City, the Ghostbusters. Halloween has long been associated with spirituality, the dead, and the occult, and I only recently learned that some of my fellow Christian friends don't participate in Halloween because of this. Christians and non-Christians alike are convinced of Halloween's pagan origins, and with the abundance of violence, gore, sensuality, occultism, and demonic aspects now associated with Halloween, it's hard not to. But is Halloween a pagan holiday, or is it a hijacked holy day? How does the Catholic Church feel about it? And since we're on the topic of ghosts, are they even real? And is believing in them in accordance with our Catholic faith? What's the difference between a ghost and a demon? I'm incredibly excited to welcome back Father John Zeta, our diocesan exorcist with a PhD in psychology, to answer all our spooky questions about Halloween and finally lay to rest, see what I did there, how we should feel about the dead. Father Zeta, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to have you back on the program and talking about Halloween, of all things. Of I figured you're the best person to talk to about this. I don't know, but yeah, I'm happy to be here again. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Well, I'm a priest of the diocese. I've been ordained uh, 44 years, been assistant to a uh, hospital chaplain, uh, full time for uh, 11 and a half years. I'm also a contract chaplain to uh, Danville State Hospital. I'm back up at Geisinger. I'm, I'm all over the place. So, yes. They got you pretty busy. Yes, very busy. And in, in addition to my work as exorcist, yes. So, how did you become an exorcist? I'm assuming you didn't just wake up one day. <laughs> it's really funny. I get that question all the time, especially kids, you know, you know, what made you decide to be an exorcist? And I said, well, what happened was the bishop came up to me one day and he said, I want you to be my exorcist. And that's how it happens. <laughs> Literally. I was shocked, you know. Uh, it was Bishop McFadden uh, who had appointed me. But uh, yeah, that's that's how it happens. The church lays out certain criteria. Um, and it's always the choice of the bishop. The bishop is the primary exorcist of the diocese. And then he delegates um, that authority uh, to a particular priest. And again, there are ex- uh, criteria that are laid down, um, and the bishop uses that to make his choices as to who his exorcist should be. I, and I've been the exorcist, uh, I guess, now th- nine, ten years. Ten years. Wow. Yeah. So could you tell me, what is Halloween, and how, do, how does the Catholic Church feel about its celebration? Okay, well, first of all, Halloween means All Hallows' Eve, all right? So obviously, it's a Catholic holiday. Most people just don't get it, all right? The Church's tradition is a threefold thing. We have Halloween, we have All Saints' Day, we have All Souls' Day. They are a, con- a con- connected integral, all right? So the point is that um, so many of— uh, the symbols and customs associated with Halloween were actually Catholic in origin. So, for example, the other day I actually said to somebody, you know, what are the colors for Halloween? Well, black and orange. 
Well, why are black and orange the colors of Halloween? Because the church's uh, practice was that for a funeral, you always used unbleached candles, which were orange. And of course, you wore black vestments for funerals. That's where the black and orange comes from. Interestingly enough, even today in the church, it's really only in the United States that we wear white for funerals. That was an American invention, believe it or not. If you ever see, you know, somebody said to me the other day, where did I see that? And they said, oh, yeah, the Queen's funeral. They were unbleached candles and they were wearing black vestments. That's Catholic tradition, right? So Halloween is, is really geared towards All Souls Day with All Saints Day in between them. And even the practice of, for example, going trick-or-treating, what happened was uh, children would go to homes and they would knock on the door and they would request what they would used to call soul cakes in exchange for praying for the souls of the deceased of that particular family. All right, so we have this idea of, you know, tricks or treats. Well, the treat actually was uh, a, an offering made for the person, the children usually, to be able to um, uh, pray for the dead. So that's that's so there, it's it's all Catholic. It's all Catholic from from the inside out. No problem. The other thing that's funny is uh, jack o' lanterns, carved pumpkins. Okay, we associate them with the demons and all that. Now, now it was actually the other way around. They would carve demons and put candles in them to scare the demons away during the night. That's that's the origin of the jack o' lanterns, right? So again, it, it was all Catholic in its origins, you know. Not it's so you know it's gotten twisted as actually somebody mentioned on our workshop this week down there. So many of our Catholic things have been appropriated by the other side. For example, the rainbow. All right. Well, we know what it was. It was originally the sign of God's God's covenant with creation, and now it's been appropriated by the gay movement. All right. So, but that's what has happened all across the board. And so much of even the um, uh, Halloween practices um, are actually Catholic. That's so fascinating. I didn't know anything about the soul cakes or why we trick or treated or anything. Like I knew some of the story, but I actually thought that Halloween and All Saints Day and All Souls Day were completely separate. And that nope. makes so They're much more sense all interconnected, yes. Mm -hmm. All interconnected. So then actually, what happened was, you know, so they would trick-or-treat on, on All Souls uh, on the night of um, Halloween. They would celebrate All Souls, All Saints Day. But then in the tradition, after Vespers of All Saints Day, when the priest wore white, he would then switch and wear black in order to celebrate the Vespers of the Dead for the day that was coming up. So even on All Saints Day, they celebrated black vestments for the Vespers of the Dead for the following day. So all three days are interconnected. Wow, that's so fascinating. I love learning about stuff like that. So you mentioned that the traditions of Halloween kind of are appropriated by other the other sure. side. Right. Yeah. So then why is Halloween so closely associated with the occult and witchcraft, and why do they end up so glamorized? Well, first of all, it is because of the um, association with the dead, all right? And so, again, that's how the other side has appropriated it, because of its association with the dead. And, and of course, you know, there's, there's physical life and there's physical death, and there's spiritual life and spiritual death, all right? And so they have just taken something that... And again, we've lost, part of the problem is us. We have lost, for example, the fact that we don't wear black vestments anymore, that oftentimes we celebrate the person's resurrection. We celebrate, you know, a remembrance of their life or something like that, rather than praying for the dead. We have lost it, and they picked it up. See, that's where the whole thing comes in. You know, they, when, when we don't remember our own traditions and we don't practice our own traditions, they're going to be picked up someplace else. Right. Yeah. I come to think of it, I remember wearing purple to one of my grandmother's funerals, but she also requested it because she, she had red hair when she was living and yeah. her mother never let her wear red. So she <laughs> wanted to be buried wearing red. And okay. we're like, well, if she's going to be buried in red, then the rest of us should wear yeah. colors. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's, that's the whole thing. We, well, when we forget, somebody else picks up. Right. 
And so that's why it has gotten twisted all out of proportion because it's it's no longer in its proper context. Hmm. So you mentioned spiritual life and spiritual death. I have a $6 million question for you. <laughs> okay. Are ghosts real? Are ghosts real? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can have um, different ways in which they manifest. But generally speaking, ghosts will inhabit a particular place. All right. And if you actually look at any hauntings, authentic hauntings, okay, what you discover is that the ghost is attached to a place. There was something that um, is keeping them there, is tying them there, but which they cannot satisfy on their own. They require the assistance of somebody else to come in and do it for them so that they can be free. Well, if you stop and think about it, that's the definition of purgatory. Mm. A person who dies, all right, they have restitution that has to be made, all right. Um, they're stuck in a certain place. They can't do it on their own. They require somebody else to pray for them, do, and then and only then can they be free to go to heaven. So, yes, ghosts generally tend to speak uh, to be um, the souls of the deceased. Now, sometimes, of course, um, demons will um, inhabit a place. So they may come across as um, as ghosts. But in fact, uh, most ghosts or hauntings tend to be souls of the dead. All right. And again, the key is whether or not the ghost, quote unquote, is engaging in conversation with outsiders. So God does not allow the dead to engage in those conversations with the living, which is why most ghost stories, they don't actually tell you anything. You have to kind of infer or discover what needs to be done to free them. All right. Um, so, but for, for demons, demons will do all kinds of tricks and games in order to get you into their realm. So, um, generally speaking, if the ghost is, you know, talking, communicating with you, that's a demon. But if the, the ghost is just kind of communicating, but not actually saying anything, not engaging in conversation, then that's usually a poor, poor soul in purgatory, uh, needs somebody else to free them. That's so fascinating. I never really put the two and two together that if they're, if they're not interacting, like from a, a verbal standpoint. Correct. Right that it's a ghost versus a demon. You kind of just answered my next question, which is, what's the difference? Um, so is that the main difference or are there other Primarily, that's the primary difference. Okay. Yeah. You know, generally speaking, you know, when there's a house or a place that's haunted, the exorcist will have to come in and try to determine what's the cause of the haunting. So for example, if a house is haunted and it's actually a soul, um, generally speaking, we either do, we can pray the office of the dead or even sometimes go into that place and celebrate a mass for the dead for that particular soul. And that's enough to free them. All right. And whereas if it's a demon that is inhabiting the place, then sometimes you need to actually do a little bit. So, for example, we had a case. In fact, I was, I was talking to one of the priests about it this week, uh, several years ago, of a home. And um, they were experiencing all kinds of negative things in the home, but especially their young boy, who was like maybe three or four, was really under physical attack, okay? So we went there, and what we discovered was this is a very old home and in a very rural part of our diocese. And in the basement was the old town well, and there was a slab, a um, um, slate slab that covered the well on which we actually found uh, occult symbolisms drawn. We also found some up in the attic on some of the beams, all right? So we knew that this probably what had happened was um, this town well had been the site of maybe a, a coven doing all kinds of occult practices many, many, many years ago. But the building is built over this well where these things occurred. So we actually had to have a minor exorcism of the house in order to drive out the demons. And we did. And, and the young boy, we anointed him with oil and all of his senses and freed him completely. I mean, ever there was no problems after that whatsoever. So, um, yeah, the, the, so that's what you have to do. You have to figure out which it is what causes them to be there in the first place, and then you apply the appropriate remedy. 
That's fascinating. I never knew that you could exercise a place. I always thought it was just a person. At least that's what the movies always say. But that's really interesting to hear that there's different types. And yes. It's what we call a minor exorcism. Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. So one of my guilty pleasures is watching this show called Tyler Henry Hollywood Medium. If you haven't seen it, Tyler is a young man who's clairvoyant and he believes that his gift to see things and deliver messages of closure is from God. Likewise, Ed and Lorraine Warren were devoutly Catholic paranormal investigators who famously investigated the Amityville horror case, Ed as a demonologist and Lorraine as a clairvoyant trans medium. And throughout their careers, they allegedly worked very closely with clergy to identify and document manifestations of demonic infestation, oppression, and possession. And in the Bible, there are many verses advising against seeking out mediums. But in 1 Samuel chapter 28, King Saul goes to the witch of Endor to conjure up the ghost of the prophet Samuel, and it worked. Can you explain what a medium or a clairvoyant is, why they're advised against, and is it different from being a mystic? Or what if those gifts yeah. are used to help Okay, it's a good, good point. And it's the interesting thing of those two cases that you mentioned, the young man versus this Catholic couple. I'm going to say that the young man is in a safer place than the Catholic couple. Now, here's the reason why. There's an old book, a classic book, which you can get in reprint now. It's called Occult Phenomenon in the Light of Theology, right? Which we've actually studied in terms of psychology. And what it does is, you know, the, and it's, it has an imprimatur, so it's, it's good Catholic work, um, not widely known. Um, in it, the priest, I can't remember the name of the author, but it's, it was a German. Uh, anyway, he um, posits the fact that so many of these experiences, when you talk about clairvoyance or, or those sorts of things, are actually, in a sense, holdovers from before the fall. They were part of the preternatural gifts that God had given to human beings before the fall, and they were weakened. They were not lost, but weakened. So in many cases, they're buried deep within the person's soul. So some people can see, can hear, all right, those kinds of things, all right? I would never suggest that anybody act as a medium, though, because that's where the demons can sneak in. No question about that. The other couple, though, that you mentioned, I, I have a real problem with, with that. And, and it's like we mentioned the fact that, let's say, a priest who engages in, let's say, deliverance ministry or those blessings or so forth, it his ordination as a priest gives him a certain protection, if you will. An exorcist, not only being a priest, but also the mandate of the bishop, he has extra authority and protection by virtue of his mandate, right? So when confronting the demons, it's not me who's confronting a demon. It's actually the bishop's authority that's confronting the demon, right? But now you have this couple that you say who are paranormal investigators. I think it's very, very bad practice because what does this couple have? All that this couple has is, you know, they can say, oh, by virtue of their baptism. Well, yeah, but all they have at any given moment is the state of their soul at that particular moment. And how can they really know for sure? For a priest, even a priest in mortal sin when he celebrates Mass, the Mass is still valid. He still consecrates the Eucharist, even if he's in mortal sin, because of the virtue of his priesthood. That particular couple could be opening themselves up to all kinds of demonic influence because they're operating on nobody's authority but their own. And that's where the danger is. Now, I'm not saying that they're not sincere and honest, but, you know, I had a case many time, many years ago of a gentleman who was experiencing some things in his home. He heard a voice of a woman. I went there any number of times. We kept trying to figure out what it was, where it was, why it was there. Um, one day, I was leaving the house, and I heard the voice myself. I turned to him, and I said to him, Tim, I said, I heard her. I know what you're talking about. What we have to determine now is this uh, uh, lost soul 
or is this a demon pretending to be a lost soul? I said, when we can figure that out, we'll know how to proceed. Well, what did Tim do? Tim went and he brought in a paranormal investigating team. And literally all hell broke loose in that house. And he couldn't understand why. I said, Tim, they came in with their, you know, their microphones and their cameras. And they said, okay, they opened, uh, they sent a card, a welcome card to, to hell. Come on in. We want to hear you. We want to see you. We want to record you. You know, it was an open invitation to the demons to come in. He wondered why all hell broke loose there. Well, that's where you have to be really careful about those things. Um, because you can slip into all kinds of trouble without even intending to do so. Right. It makes me think of all those shows like Ghost Hunters. Sure, or... but very dangerous stuff. Right. Very dangerous stuff. You know, I had a, co- a case where I was speaking at a place, and uh, the pastor said, um, you know, I'd like, I brought this group, there was like four or five of them, that they, they call themselves paranormal investigators. And he wanted them to be there to hear my talk. But I met with them privately beforehand. And let me tell you, I was very scared for this group, especially there was like a, a young girl who was part of this group. Um, two of them had never been baptized. I said, you are putting yourself in serious, serious danger. You're playing with something that is beyond your ability. I said, don't do that to yourselves, and especially to this young girl. So, you know, I don't know what happened to them after that night, but um, it, you can be, it can be very dangerous. Right. So we touched on this briefly in our last episode and then again just now about how those who have passed away are not allowed to communicate to the, to the living verbally um, and that us trying to communicate to the dead through Ouija boards or other methods like paranormal investigators is opening a door. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, He says not to believe every spirit, but to try them to see if they are from God and that everyone that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Adam Bly, who's a church decreed expert on religious demonology and exorcism in the Pittsburgh diocese, says that spirits from purgatory, like you had said, can appear in hopes of intercessory prayer, but they're not permitted to speak. So for argument's sake, let's say we run into a spirit. How do we use John's instructions for testing the spirit if they can't answer us? First of all, let me say that Adam Bly is a good friend of mine. No way! <laughs> oh, yeah. So we know each other well. We've we've been to many conferences and so forth together. So, in fact, I call him on a regular basis. We consult about all kinds of things. So, yeah, he's a very, very good friend of mine. That's awesome. Um, so, anyway, um, when you again, you talk about um, the, the spirit. See, the, the number one problem here is this is a violation of faith, Mm. right? Because I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to know, rather than trusting in God, all right? And this is where the problem with Ouija boards and tarot cards, you know, it's all a matter of, it's, it's power and control. People, we live in such an insecure time, all right? Um, the bishop just actually talked to us in his homily that just a little while ago about anxiety being the number one health issue in, in America today, all right? And I believe that. And, um, you know, post-COVID, so, so many different things. But I think what has happened is, and I didn't mention this to him, I will eventually, um, I'm seeing an uptick in people turning to the occult because they're looking for security, they're looking for answers, they're looking for black and white, they want some sort of stability, all right? And they're not finding it in their, they're so so insecure in their world that that's why they turn to the occult. They want answers, they want stability, they want something that they can stand on. And that's why they're getting into trouble. But again, it's a violation of the the, um, theological virtue of faith. It's also a violation of the first commandment, you shall have no gods before me, right? Uh, and so that's why those are dangerous things, because they're putting something else, all right, ahead of God. And all of those occult practices are demonic, whether they want to admit it or not or like it or not, they are. That's interesting. Then what's the difference between praying to a saint, which is encouraged, versus communicating with the dead, which is strongly discouraged, even though they're both dead? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, because you know, in the in the mystical body of Christ, okay. Each of the three dimensions has their own function, if you will. 
So, you know, and when we have saints in heaven, one of their primary functions, I mean, they're in heaven, so to speak, and not yet complete or full because they don't have their bodies yet. But, you know, intercession, prayer for us, all right, is part of their mission, if you want to call it that. Whereas the souls in purgatory can't. They're stuck, all right? They can't do anything for themselves. So they rely on us, all right? We rely on the saints, all right? The souls in purgatory rely on us, all right? So there's a dynamic here between the three parts of the mystical body, which is very, very important. So again, you don't communicate with the dead because, again, that's a violation of faith, all right? It's a violation of the of uh, this whole uh, trust in God, Whereas praying to the saints is a different ballgame because they are already in communion with God, all right? I mean, now we sometimes make a serious mistake and we think that, and you just read the obituaries, you know, all you have to do to get to heaven is die, you know? It's like, you know, die becomes, you know, that becomes your ticket to heaven. Uh, that's not necessary. We're making some presumptions there that we don't know for sure whether this person is really in heaven or not, which is why funerals, should be focused on praying for the deceased, for the remission of their sins and for their everlasting life, all right? Too many funerals don't do that anymore, all right? They're focused too much on, you know, this person is now in heaven and, and all those other kinds of stuff. And we can't assume that, and yet we're doing that all over the place. So that's the difference. You know, we the, the saints in heaven intercede for us, we need their intercession. The souls in purgatory need our intercession. So there's a dynamic which is built into the very system, so to speak. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, you're right. Um, I've noticed that a lot of funerals nowadays are more for the closure for the living versus right. closure for the deceased. Right. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm I feel a lot better about Halloween now and, okay. and learning some of the history and it's so I just love learning about history and, and then the things that are interesting about our faith and how where things actually come from and my pleasure my pleasure anytime you know where to find me yeah. <laughs> thank you God thank bless you. you thank you so much for listening our goal at the Diocese of Harrisburg is to walk with you on your faith journey so if this episode resonated with you in any way the easiest way to show your appreciation is by sharing this program with your network or by leaving a review on your listening platform. You can also support us financially by making a donation online at hbgdiocese.org slash D-A-C and clicking the make a donation button. Thanks again, and we'll see you at church on Sunday.